Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards and in this lesson we'll take another look at compensating updates and ways to resolve some of the issues that I talked about earlier on. You can get a listing of all the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday from my website at developertoarchitect.com slash lessons. Way back in lesson 148, well, I guess it wasn't too far back, but <laughs> it seems like it was a long time ago, uh, I did a lesson on the fallacies of compensating updates, uh, those compensating transactions to reverse an action we do within a distributed architecture. And as a matter of fact, in that lesson, I talked about and coined and published fallacy number 10 of distributed computing. And that is that compensating updates always work. And what I showed in Lesson 148 were two problems with compensating updates. Those side effects that happen as we place an order and commit that data and then apply a payment, these are all separately uh, committed transactions within our quote unit of work request. And I showed that we don't have the I part of ACID, which is the isolation, which means if counts receivables asks payment for all of its information, uh, it receives that 90 US and then takes further action and possibly sends it to downstream systems. And the issue is that, of course, we don't have isolation, so we can take actions on that data. But this transaction didn't work. So I tell payment through a compensating update to reverse that payment. We reverse that insert of the order and generate an error to the user. And that was the first side effect I talked about because during the course of that transaction, anybody else can read any of this data or ask me for this data and we're still in the middle of that transaction. And then I showed the other part of the fallacy of compensating updates, that compensating updates always work. And if we try to reverse that payment, that could fail, which now I'm in a pretty significant inconsistent state and I have no idea what to tell the user. Well, I ended lesson 148 with this problem because the purpose of that lesson was to really show uh, the fallacies of just simply using a compensating transaction or a compensating update during the course of a distributed transaction. What I want to show in this lesson is one way of uh, addressing this issue. And that way is with datum or request state management, where that particular request, let's say in this case it's an order ID, or particular pieces of data have corresponding state associated with them. When we create an order in this scenario here, it can be an accepted state, it can be in paid state, it can be an inventory adjusted state, and finally, the transaction's complete, placed state. Now we could assign that to a particular key based on that request, like an order ID or a transaction ID or a trade confirmation ID. Or we can associate this type of state with particular data items, datum. And let me show you how this might work. So we go to create an order. Order placement inserts it right here, which we can see is inserted one, two, three. Now we're still, we're still in the transaction. The user is still waiting. And at this point, that order and all the corresponding data becomes an accepted state. Uh, we got to apply the payment. That becomes now paid state. Now here is where we can actually simulate isolation and actually implement isolation within our distributed architecture. Because you see, we're still in the course of a transaction. So I may reverse that. In other words, what I'm trying to do is simulate the I part of an ACID or database transaction where we do normal commits and rollbacks. So in this case, what happens is accounts receivable asks payment for 
any receivables, any payments that have happened. But because that data item, because that datum is not in placed state, accounts receivables doesn't see it. Uh, payment can have that logic. If accounts receivables talks directly to the database, it would of course have to have that state. But the idea here is accounts receivables is asking payment for that information. We're still in a transaction and I don't care what state it's in, it's not placed. You cannot see that data. And it's a really interesting way of being able to kind of simulate that transactional isolation. Now, we continue with our processing, so we avoid those side effects, and inventory adjustment fails. Now, instead of trying to reverse this transaction with compensating updates that I demonstrated through fallacy number 10, don't always work. Instead, we leave the data as it is, and we just produce an error, knowing that all the data that we've inserted or acted upon has particular state associated with it. So now, what we can also simulate here is recoverability, restartability. Try again. Okay, let me hit enter again. Well, we know the status or the state is in paid, and all of us know that. So order placement directs it straight to inventory management to try that again, and maybe now it works. If not, well, we can certainly time out some of these actions and then try to compensate them without the user having to wait for them. Now, one of the things that's kind of required for this kind of technique to happen is that all services involved in that request need to know the state of where we're at. And one way to effectively do this is through in-memory replicated caching. The idea is all of us have an in-memory replicated cache, updatable. All of us can update this. And they're all, all those caches are kept in sync uh, through tools like Hazelcast or Ignite, uh, Coherence, Gemfire, and Finispan. Uh, so that once it's in paid state, payment processing changes the state of this request and all other caches and all other services, all other instances involved in this request all know that request 123 and these particular data items are all in paid status. So therefore I know it's not complete yet. Don't query it, don't take any action on it, don't use it for any sort of accumulation or sums or aggregations. Um, it's not data that we can access yet. And this is one way of kind of sharing that state of data or the request and being able to not have to, well, worry about or deal with the fact that compensating updates don't always work. <laughs> now, way back, and this time I can say way back in Lesson 78, I think this is actually before I was even doing video portions, um, I did a, a lesson on caching topologies of replicated caching. And in this lesson, you can find out a few more details about uh, this sharing of state through in-memory replicated caches. All right, well, this was lesson 176. We're getting close to lesson 200. That's going to be a big milestone. Uh, but this was compensating updates revisited, kind of answering some of the questions in the comments section from lesson 148 about, yes, this is a big problem. How do you address it? <laughs> and addressing compensating updates is extremely difficult uh, when they fail. And uh, this is one technique that I have used to, to help address this kind of problem of distributed transactions and the fact that it does not uh, support ACID properties. Well, thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in two more Mondays for our next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.